someone for each. We've got somebody for each seat. Wait a sec here, let me just. Okay, so for seat one, we've got James Hill from Latitude 48 Paddling Club in Victoria. Uh, for seat two, we've got Marcus uh, Krieger from Fairway Gorge Paddling Club in, also in Victoria. For seat three, we've got Paola Ameglio uh, out of Miami. Uh, for seat four, we've got Leanne uh, from Kelowna Paddle Center, Leanne Stanley. Uh, for seat five, we've got Chelsea Tidmarsh from Calgary Canoe Club. And uh, for seat six, uh, I'll chime in. And um, if anybody else is a steer here, I'm just looking, um, they can also chime in. Feel free to chime in as well. Okay. Um, so I'll hand it off to the, uh, the speakers, I guess, in seat order to, uh, to give a, a quick uh, summary of their experience and to start, start off the discussion. Uh, we'll group the discussion today basically in um, two, two groups, uh, flat water, and open water. We probably won't really have uh, time to go to the, to the open water discussion, um, but uh, we'll start off with flat water and see how far it goes from there. Uh, we'll be talking about the seat rolls and uh, how, how each of the seats um, uh, coordinates with other paddlers in the canoe and um, what their specific roles and, and what their strategies and techniques might be. So I'll hand it off to James. Uh, did you want me to give a background first or just get right into the discussion, Ron? Uh, give a background of yourself. Uh, and then as we move to each, uh, to each path, they can give a background of, of, their, of the, sure. themselves as well. Okay. Uh, so I've been paddling uh, for over 20 years now. Um, Outrigger specifically for about the last 12, 11 or 12. Um, I've done seat one. So uh, for all kinds of local races. I've done the Molokai Hoi in seat one. I've done Pailolo in seat one. I've done Catalina, um, Nationals, Gorge Downwind Champs, uh, Queen Lily, all that kind of stuff. I've done them all in stroke seat and some other seats as well, multiple times. Uh, I've been doing seat one primarily in Outrigger for pretty much since I started. So um, yeah, hopefully that's enough of a background for you. Um, how did you want me? So. So coming into the, the, this discussion and, and looking at what was presented about how we were gonna start, uh, what I did is I kind of didn't prepare at all. And I'm pretending that, that Ron, you just phoned me up this morning and said, hey, we need someone to come and race bridges today. Can you just show up? And so I'm showing up and I'm meeting all of you for the first time and I'm trying to figure this out. So that's kind of how I'm approaching this. I've done no preparation at all, just in the spirit of having this discussion openly. So. Is that, is that a good spot to start? Yeah, sure, that's, that's fine, that's good. Okay, so, so as a seat one coming in, um, you know, my, my first job is to sort of understand that I'm in the service of the crew and, and not having any experience with any of the people who have paddled or what the crew does. I'm getting into that seat in kind of a, a blank slate, not really understanding what kind of pace you want, what kind of stroke length you want. Um, and that kind of thing there. So I'm kind of of the opinion with stroke seats is that, you know, stroke seats certainly can't win a race for you, but they can definitely lose them by themselves, right? And so I have to sort of put that ego aside and realize when I'm getting into the crew, I have to understand what the crew wants. And that first probably five minutes or warm up is gonna be sent evaluating what, what the crew wants from me as far as pace, quickness, stroke length, all that kind of stuff there too. Um, probably have a, have a discussion with, with you as a steerer, for sure, Ron, like if, if we're talking about a, a, a out and back loop race, there's gonna be a buoy turn involved. So I have to understand what you want as a steerer uh, from me coming into the turn, coming out of the turn. Uh, one of the main things, especially in a flat water race, which you touched on already, is that the stroke seat is definitely part of the steering equation, 100%. They're looking out for things as well. They're, you know, I like, I'm actually pretty active as far as trying to bump the boat around here and there if, if we see an obstacle or if I feel a hard correction or something like that so I'm paying attention. Uh, maybe I'll have a discussion with especially you know looking at the crew here um, you know Marcus is a big rangy guy. Uh, Paolo I don't know you but you look like a big strong powerful guy so so you know what's the crew strategy where are you where are you getting your your strength from where are you getting your power from you know who am I paddling for mostly am I paddling for for Chelsea and five, or is it from Leanne and four, you know, or, or all a combination of the above, or, or what's the, what's the sort of structure of what the crew wants from me, um, whether it's, like I said, 
quick rate, slow rate, that kind of thing there. And that's kind of what I would do just to start and I'm going out and I'm just kind of assessing as we go what's working. Um, you know, you can only gain so much from a discussion. So when you start to paddle, um, one thing you do as a stroke is you're always trying to figure out, okay, where's the wobble? Is there a wobble? Where's the wobble? Am I feeling a rush, which I'm feeling a little kick in the ass? Am I feeling like I'm losing people if I'm going too fast? And I'm always constantly adjusting up and down until I find that moment where it's like, there it is. Whole crews come together and we're holding together. Uh, you know, I like to, I, I can go pretty fast, but I know if I start to come up and we lose the crew, I'll bring, come back down with my rate to try and collect everyone to get that overlapping power phase happening all the time. And then sort of test up and down from there. Uh, I'll be expecting a lot of feedback from Marcus as my two. You know, he knows the crew better than I do probably. So, so he's there to connect me to the rest of the crew and let me know whether, you know, hey, you're going too fast or hey, the crew can use a little bit more. I'll expect a little bit more feedback from the middle of the boat as well because that's usually probably where most of the power is coming from. So I'm probably working in service of them more than anybody else. And so I'm looking for a lot of feedback from them as well. And again, that's where as a stroke seat, you have to put your ego aside and just be like, it's not about me. I have to be able to, to put that aside and just paddle in service of the crew 100% of the time and give them what they need because I, I'm not in a position where I'm supposed to be being the powerful person in the boat. I'm just setting a pace where the powerful people in the boat can make the boat go fast more than anything. So I think that's a good place to start. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, with, with uh, crew composition, you know, you really have to think about um, changing it up between, say, a mixed crew and a men's crew, or, or you know, if you got uh, a woman in stroke for a women's crew, the the uh, stroke rate and so forth will, will be different for each type of crew as well, right? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of that comes from uh, a lot of coming that will come from like sort of crew uh, philosophies as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some clubs, people, crews like a quicker pace. You know, I, I myself you know, five years ago, six years ago, I wanted a quicker pace as I'm getting along and as we're getting more information from different places and different sort of paddling techniques and things like that. And Leanne's smiling because she knows what I'm talking about here. Uh, we're starting to slow down. We're starting to get more patient. You know, I know that uh, our men's crew is definitely like pretty drastically underrates a lot of the competition we have in races. And that's where I like to be now. It's just really focusing on that big sort of wind, you know, come forward and get that catch in and big unwind as you go. I want the same type of thing from our, our women's crews as well, but you're right. Um, if they can't generate quite the same amount of force to lift the canoe up and go between strokes, they might have to slightly quicker pace, right? Because they're not getting quite as much run out of the canoe between strokes. Um, maybe someone else can chime in on that. That would be what I'm expecting as well. But, you know, recently we did, uh, we did bridges where we did men's and mixed and the I stroked the men's race very slow. Uh, Melanie, my girlfriend, she stroked the mixed race. She was a little bit quicker, not appreciably. Yeah, Leanne thought it was a little bit quick. I thought it was okay. Like I was sat in seat five for the mixed race. And so I was able to still get nice solid water. Um, it was okay I wasn't for 5K. Really anything. What's that? It was okay for 5K. I wouldn't have wanted to do that more. Yeah, long. yeah. Well, I mean, 5K, like, and that's another thing too, is right, you got to take advantage. If we're talking about a 5K race, like, you know, you're not you're not racing 10k pace at, at for a 5k you're racing like just able to get across the line at 5k and that's it so you want to be right at the boundary of what's possible and whether that's again your crew your crew is like is that a is that a force thing where you're you know outputting more force on each stroke and getting that nice big pull or are you going like a little bit quicker like near more closer to a sprint pace like that to keep it up high for that time that's all crew philosophy there and i don't think that it's um I don't think it's necessarily as gender-based um, for the rate as we may have once considered it to be. Oh, okay. So does anybody else on the panel or uh, any of the participants have any questions or comments on with respect to seat one? I think as we go along, we're, things are gonna come up as we talk about different situations. Right now we're kind of in the generals sure. stage. Um, and I, I, did, I did actually forgot to mention that um, you can add uh, ask questions in the chat uh, in the messaging. Um, that's pro probably the best. And then Leanne and I and Val will monitor the chat uh, and then pose the questions to the panel. There is a question uh, right now that maybe we should get to right away because it 
it's pertinent to what James was just talking about is, could you just uh, define what is quick and slow and medium in strokes per minute? Sure. Yeah, that's a, I don't, I don't know if I can quantify it in strokes per minute exactly. Um, I, I look at it more like, um, you know, you're, you have, a, you have a, a really long pace for your quote, quote unquote slower stroke, right? But it's all about how much force you're presenting and how much, you know, effort you're getting between strokes to let the boat do the work. Uh, you know, if you're going to go faster, you can't go faster with the same length of stroke. You just can't do it. You'll start to lose pieces. Pieces of the stroke are going to fall off and you're not going to be as effective. So if you're going to start to bring that up from a fully connected stroke, you have to start making that stroke shorter and moving it more up front. And actually, um, you know, if you're going to go like, say you get into like in bridges, for example, you're coming up and all of a sudden, hey, we're in a shallow spot. What are you going to do? We have to change from that nice long slow rate to maybe like moving it up front a little bit and going a little bit quicker and shorter with your stroke to lift that boat up and get it on plane and move it through the, through the short, the shallower water. Um, as far as the strokes per minute, like, I don't know, Leanne probably has a little bit more idea of what she wants there, but I would say you can race like around low fifties, high forties, if you can get away with it. Right. Higher end is going to be like 65, maybe at the, at the top end. I don't know. That's how fast also... you're going. And I think Paula wants to talk to this. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. I saw I saw that face light up as soon as we started talking yeah. about it. Well, when I saw the I saw the question in the chat, I mean, stroke rate is such like it's, like it's like the loaded gun, right? Everybody wants to know what stroke rate I should be at. And I always uh, the the thing I always ask them when they say what's the stroke rate is well, how fast is the boat going? Mm -hmm. because okay. stroke rate is determined by boat mm -hmm. speed not the other way around yeah. and mm -hmm. a lot of paddlers especially novice paddlers mm -hmm. think the faster i paddle the faster the boat goes and so you know i'll throw some numbers at you uh i was leanne's probably had the same conversation we were speaking with i was speaking with johnny and he had the dana point women mm -hmm. in an unlimited canoe so take into account that that's a 200 pound boat basically um, 47, uh, strokes per minute at eight and a half miles an hour. So I know you guys are metric, but you can, you can, you can do the conversion. Um, and that's, and that, if you start looking at teams like Shelva, if you start looking at EDT, if you start looking at some of the teams that we, that a lot of us talk about when we're trying to give examples of, of good stroke mechanics and good, good boat movement, they're all running, even in a, you know, when you go, so if, if, if your cruise pace in that scenario, if your cruising pace is a 47, when you go, when you start to jack up the rate, you're not going to go from a 47 to a 62. You might go up four strokes a minute, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, so you, you're going to take it off the tail. You're still going to hit your catch. And so you'll go from a 47 to a 52, maybe a 55, you know, but again, it's got to be determined by the speed of the boat you know and your effort and your climb and your meters you know your meters per stroke if you're getting four meters per stroke you know you're you're cruising you know so it's 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 i i i'm always hesitant to say you should paddle at this stroke rate because it's it, it, it it'll shoot you in the foot every single time yeah i, I totally agree with that and there's also things like wind current all that kind of stuff plays a role in how fast you actually can go or how fast you may want to go. Uh, there's different stroke styles. Like if you're going up current, up wind, it's going to be a little bit different than if you're going downwind or just straight flat water, things like that. So it can get pretty complicated, but I absolutely agree that, that um, it's hard to, if you're trying to pinpoint a number, right, you're probably going to miss, you're going to, you're going to lose some of your efficiency somewhere along the way if you're trying to pinpoint on a number. I agree. Yeah. Like I said, so we, we can get really into so many can't really topics. Answer, yeah. We can't really answer the question, is, yeah. the, is the point, <laughs> because we got to know how fast your theoretical boat is moving. <laughs> My answer would be it's all about feel. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. That is true. All right. Marcus, they do. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Marcus. Um, I've been paddling for about 19 years now. I've been sitting in a lot of seats. Uh, I would say primarily I've been stroke seat, two seat, five seat for a lot of different races. I was a stroke seat for Molokai Hoe, for Pailolo Crossing, for Catalina Crossing a couple of times. 
Um, I've done two and five for a lot of change races, distance races, or just local stuff as well. But I've got a number of years of experience. I'd probably say in Outrigger specifically, 12, 13 years probably, uh, somewhere, somewhere around there. But um, two seats uh, in particular. And uh, I, I think uh, James touched on a lot of um, my points already, but uh, two seat, uh, my primary objective there is to kind of have as perfect timing as possible with seat one uh, and to work very closely with seat one. You know, um, seat one, uh, just sitting up there kind of all by themselves there, they don't have much uh, connection to the rest of the crew besides like boat feel and things like that. So uh, my, my job is to kind of uh, be the liaison between stroke and the rest of the canoe. So I'm there to communicate with James, pass on any calls that might be coming down the boat in case it's windy or whatever, and he can't hear them. Uh, my job is to kind of, you know, keep him on track, let him know what feels good, what doesn't feel good. And um, just, just working with the crew uh, to kind of give us the best boat run possible. But uh, seat two is um, a relatively demanding role. Um, you need to have really good technique, really good timing. You have to be able to match kind of whatever stroke is in front of you. So, you know, if you're working with a brand new seat one um, or brand new to you seat one, um, you have to be able to match their stroke length. You have to be able to match their catch position, exit uh, placement, all that kind of stuff. Um, and to try to emulate as much as, as possible. You're kind of uh, translating their stroke uh, into something that the rest of the boat can use as well. Um, especially with, uh, you know, four seat being on the same side as you. Uh, it's kind of your job to uh, create a stroke that will work for the, again, the remaining seats behind you as well. But um, yeah, be, beyond matching stroke, uh, the stroke seat, it's uh, about communication and uh, just kind of working with the crew to establish, again, whatever works the best for your, uh, your given crew. And uh, James made a nice point about uh, how going into this meeting, um, it's, it's, it's actually in our favor to have uh, no kind of set plan uh, because we are working as a brand new crew together. Um, so you're not going to really have too much of a plan going into a race day with a brand new crew. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of fortunate that we have the, uh, the chance here uh, to, to you know, kind of throw ourselves into a scenario where we haven't met each other or maybe, maybe we have a little bit here and there, but uh, I've, I've only really raced with James and I don't think I've raced with anyone else in this crew. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of our discussion. Hey, does it, does anybody have any questions for Marcus, or? Not yet. I have a question for him later, but I want to hear everybody else first. <laughs> OK. OK, I've so always, moving on to, oh, sorry, just, go ahead. Just from a coach's perspective, I always talk about seat two. Like, your job is to whisper sweet nothings to seat one oh. kind of thing, right? Or whisper. Yeah, yeah. following your stroke seat. Yeah. To, to be encouraging, yeah, exactly. I, I will say that um, I think the, the dynamics between one and two change drastically when you're getting into a wave race, big open water race as versus a flat water race. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the seat two's job expands a lot um, if you get into rougher water. Yeah. Could you That's elaborate on that, James? Well, we're, we're, I would love to, but we'll save that for the next meeting, I think. OK. I mean, it's probably seat two in a lot of ways is one of the most, it's, it's probably the most important seat in the boat because half, half your crew is, mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't, is, is out of timing, you know? So you need someone smart, someone that's got perfect, you know, perfect timing. And, and a lot of times you want somebody maybe that's a little heavier too, because you can front load the boat, right? You want to, you want to have the boat a little bit front heavy. So, I mean, C2 is your second stroker, but it's, they got to, they got to, they got to not brain damage the stroker. Like you said, whisper the sweet nothings and then translate what the stroker's saying. Cause sometimes, sometimes strokers feel isolated. It's like, you know, they're like, Oh, no one loves me. I got nothing to look at, you know? So C2 keeps them connected to the crew. I, I agree. That's a tough seat. Okay, so Paolo, since you brought it up, I'll just say, like, I was speaking to another coach about this. I swear I only called her to ask her what steer blade to buy, and we spoke an hour and a half about different seat, posi seat positions. <laughs> but one of the things that she said to me, and I would like to know if you guys feel this is true, it sounds like it is, is that you cannot put a shy person in seat two. They have to be quite vocal, like, because they have to be okay and be able to speak to their seat one. But they also might have to be able to speak to the seat three and four, which, you know, want to be in charge of the boat if seat one doesn't feel like they're getting what they need. 
So I think it, it sounds like it's got to be somebody who's pretty uh, vocal, but who's also knows how to communicate to both kinds of personalities. Would you say any of that is sort of true, Marcus? Uh, yeah, I would definitely say that um, for, for being in seat two, you maybe don't have to be like super strong like communication, but you do need to um, be assertive. You need to make sure that, uh, you know, that you, you are communicating with seat one, letting them know, again, what feels good, what doesn't feel good, and uh, take any feedback given to you as well from three and four, and then translate that into a constructive way for seat one. Um, you don't need to be as vocal, but you do need to be kind of um, a bit of a rock for seat one. Uh, you made a nice point there as well that uh, seat one does kind of feel a little bit isolated uh, from the rest of the crew. Uh, you can't really see anything going on. Seat two has a good uh, vantage point of seat one and will kind of help them through the race and just make sure that they're not feeling uh, too alone and that they feel like they're, you know, um, being kind of, uh, I guess, like validated by the rest of the crew as well. Yeah, I think in a, in a race scenario like we're looking at right here as well, um, you know, from knowing myself as a paddler, I, I, I very much want my thing. I want it like this and I want it like this and I want there to be no gray area. And so I can be a little bit vocal with my two or with the crew as well for asking for things or even just like, hey, give me your feedback. I need to know if this is what you want. And, you know, where I'm sitting at in the boat, C2 is, is like you've said, Marcus, is the conduit to me to get that message back to everyone else behind you. Um, Cause I'm up there, you know, it, the steer is 40 feet away, they're not going to hear what I'm saying or asking as well. And so, you know, that that's a bit of communication dynamic that that I'll be relying on seat two for in a new crew where I don't know what's expected of me. So Can I, add I think that's just underlying the points that have already been made. But I also am very vocal as a as coming into a new crew, I would be a very vocal person asking for feedback. Go for it, Chelsea. Go ahead, Chelsea. Um, I just wanted to add, I have a personal experience from, from C2 and uh, I waited until it was too late. So it was uh, my first Molokai and I had an extreme powerhouse coming into seat one in front of me. Um, so I'm not going to give names, but she comes in and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to shut up and I just need to, I just need to be perfect, paddle perfectly. But I was quiet the whole time. So the next time we had a change, she came out and said, hey, I need more. Like I'm lonely up there. You have to give me more. I thought, oh. Okay, so I'm supposed to, you know, I didn't know that. So maybe prior that has to happen before, before you're in the middle of a channel, right? I should have asked before, or we should have all kind of maybe had that conversation so that I know all the people around me, what they need to race their best and vice versa, right? And another thing too is, is that, you know, if you've got uh, feedback going one way, you need, you need confirmation as to whether the fix addresses it. Um, so, you know, if, if, if uh, word, if, C2 relays back, uh, from three and four that rates too fast, you know, then C1 adjusts, um, you know, we need feedback again from three, four, whether it's good, with, whether that fixed it or, you know, um, you know, just, just for confirmation, otherwise people are, are wondering is, you know, how's it going, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're still on Paulo, I think, C3. Sorry, I'll unmute myself. <laughs> um, all right, so seat three. Um, How about we go with who are you, Paulo? Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Paulo. I live in Miami. Um, I coach with Pukea Designs with Paddle Ninja. I've paddled all over, um, usually in a race crew. I mean, I've sat every seat, but usually in a race crew, I get put in three or five. That's usually where they put me um, in regatta. A lot of times they'll put me in five because I can help steer and I can help, you know, uh, bring the boat around the turn because that race is all about the turn. Um, in surf races, I'll usually sit three in, you know, flat water races. I'll usually sit three. So um, <clears throat> in my cruise, seat three calls the boat. And when we are preparing for races, when I have the opportunity, I'll usually take seat three and seat six and throw them in a two man and let them develop like some good chemistry between the two of them, especially for surf races, um, because you start to know what the steers person is putting you on so that you can call the bump. Um, so we typically call the boat from the middle. So the so seat three is usually running the boat. Seat six, again, in a surf race, seat six has so much to do with, you know, 
looking this way, making sure we're not running over a whale, you know, like you name it. There's so much going on. It's a lot to ask them to then I also ask them to call every single thing. So if you've got good connection between six and three, it's it it helps the the whole flow of communication in the boat, like what we were talking about with James and you know, being able to bring it back so he can say it's a two and tell me when I'm in three, obviously I'm looking at one um, and I'm trying to give them the information they need to set the stroke, right? So I'm usually looking for my stroker to have a little bit of an overreach so that the animals that are in the middle of the boat can get some work done, right? Give them room to work is what I usually say. Um, Valerie probably got sick of hearing me say that when she was down here. Um, and it's pretty simple. I think what, uh, like Chelsea, what you were talking about with communication is one of the things I do when I go to a crew for the first time is I say, hey, you know, um, what's our vernacular? You know, like if you hear me say overreach or more water and I'm in three, this is what I'm asking you for so you understand it. And then you might say, okay, you know, I, 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 if I call an up or like if you're, if James is in one and he calls an up, I need to know what, what he means that to be, right? So I think that if you're calling the boat and you're sitting in three, one of the most important things you can do is have the conversation with a crew of saying, what does everything mean, you know? And most of my crews are fairly quiet. Like I wanna be able to hear six if, if there's an issue. And so um, <clears throat> I'm usually the one that everyone's tired of hearing my voice by the end of the race. So <laughs> they're just like, shut up, Paulo, we're done with you. Um, so that's, I mean, that's six, I mean, that's three in a, in a nutshell, you know, um, you're just all race long. You're just thinking about, you know, where's the stroke rate, where's the bump, where's the ripple in the water, you know, is the boat moving? If you're running, you, you probably have the GPS in the, in your seat. If you're looking for, for boat speed and how things are affecting, um, one of the things like Valerie will tell you is when, you know, when we call a press or a go or whatever it is, I'm looking for a half mile an hour and I'll tell the crew right there. That was good. That worked. You know, if we, if, if we're going for a move or something. So that's, you know, you, you, you have to be psychologist, cheerleader, you know, person that can calm them down, uh, person that tell everybody to shut up and paddle that's what you got to do in c3 it, it in in a crew like mine where c3 runs the boat some crews the boat is run in two they'll have somebody in two that does that and <clears throat> the thing is in a longer race you're you're not i'm not gonna like in a 30 mile race i'm not gonna call the changes all race long so two will take over i'll just say like, hey you know i need to drink some water call call the boat you know and so you, again, that's goes down to the training that you do and things like that. So that's how, how I look at three. Um, it's probably a little different than how most crews look at three. Most crews just look at three as like the, the metronome. So they just call the change, call the change, call the change. And they're listening for their cues for press or power and stuff like that from six. But I think six has so, too much, you know, so much to do. If they could keep the boat straight and get the line and get the drum line and get you on the bump, then, you know, you divide and conquer. And it, 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 I find it works a lot better. So that's, that's it. That's three in a nutshell. Okay. And, and with respect to the calling, you know, you, 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 you'll be discussing with your crew what, they, what their preference is for, for the calls. Like some crews I've been with call on 12, so you change on 14 and it drives me nuts. Uh, I'd rather change, call on 10 to change on 12 or, or even shorter, you know, if you're going upwind or whatnot, you know, yeah, depending on the conditions and stuff like that. So that's another, I guess, another factor as well. Yeah, I mean, on, on my cruise, I'll usually just call a hut and I don't want to hear a hut. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We, no, we normally just, call just a hut as well. Yeah, hut, one stroke, change. That's it. There's no ho. There's, I always say there's no pimps on the boat, so we don't need any hoes. So, well, you know. My, uh, yeah, well, my, my novice crews actually call the hose and it helps a lot with their timing in that. But uh, yeah. and apparently, it, like I remember, uh, we paddled with San, uh, San Diego crew one time and they actually called hike hut ho, which I thought was like way too many calls. Yeah, that's very old. That's very old school. You'll yeah. hear it. 
it's like it's like hut hike ho it's like shit like fucking sorry like four <laughs> strokes <laughs> you can tell i find that annoying <laughs> is that how they do things in miami huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's also oh, like man. and this is recording a lot. yeah it's, it's too many words like it's too much yeah. stuff coming yeah. out right it, yeah. it also running delay- a quiet boat yeah. it also delays the call as well too because you know, if you're, I guess if you're, no, we're not, I know we're not really talking about surfing, but if you're, if you're surfing, you know, you're going to call shorter changes and you don't want to have an extra word in there because that'll add an extra stroke, right? Yeah. And so I mean, just to, times... just to, somebody asked, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Somebody asked a question here, how do you judge the number of strokes per change? And um, so even though I race at a higher level, I also race, I also um, coach some breast cancer survivors every year. I take them over with chemo KO to paddle for life. Right. Mm. So I'm taking a group that's very um, new. They might have paddled um, a handful of times, maybe 10 times. Then we take them there, introduce them to the water. And the idea is to get them from A to B. So in case there's some people on this call that are that kind of caliber, we would not be changing 10 to 12 strokes just because it's Mm -hmm. fumbly for everybody. And we're just, okay, Mm -hmm. let's get in our rhythm. Now we're going to and hut and okay, now we're over just to keep things a little smoother. So I just wanted to stick up for those mm-hmm. ones that it doesn't have to be 10 to 12 if you're new and it's right. a total novice thing and the ocean's a big thing for you, right? So that's all. <laughs> An awesome point. Yep. No, that's a really good point. Yeah. Because we are uh, trying to get to everybody. And, and Leanne was calling. Touched... Sorry, go Ron. Sorry. No, and Leanne touched on something about um, uh, the way that seat three calls uh, and whether it's a low call, like, huh? Because you're st- you, you're you know stealthily moving up on another boat on flat water conditions, or you're t- or maybe it's a loud call to try and motivate the crew. You know if you're surfing or something, you know you really need to motivate the crew and get the power going, that sort of thing, right? So, yeah. um, in- like I've heard, inflection, inflection yeah, on the inflection on the call will make a big difference. Yeah, and with wind, wind and that you can't hear, um, you know that sort of thing. Um, I remember we. Uh, we went to uh, um, Nepali Challenge in 2014 when it was canceled because of the hurricane. And Luke Evslin um, with Kauai gave a, a little talk. And he said that over there, the, the intonation on the call um, dictates the, um, the effort level that you're, you're putting in. So if it's, uh, uh, it's pretty relaxed. But if it's, but, uh, but, uh, uh, it's, it's a lot more intense, right? So... A lot of the Tahitian crews, you'll hear them do a hut hay, and they'll do a hut with a short hay, and that's their sprint, and they'll go hut hey, and that's their long stroke. It's oh. the same call, it's just the inflection, right? You know, so it, it, it and that's you know, I, I think crews once you're practicing with your crew, you start to get your own, you start to create your own words. Like on my cruise, when we train, we'll say little bit, hut, little bit. And that just like everyone mm-hmm. kind of perks up when we say it, just it works, you know, or we'll say hut, go. And they, you know, and then they know what to do and they yeah. react. So you start to get your own vernacular as a crew. And actually um, your comments about the vernacular, it's really important because a lot, you know, a lot of times you want people to instantly recognize what you're saying or what steer is saying without having to think about it. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I remember doing Pilola for the first time and, um, you know, we called push and, and people always thought it was a hut, right? Because they couldn't, they couldn't differentiate between push and hut with the wind and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So we ended up calling go instead. We had to we had to change that on the fly during the race, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting jumping into mixed crews like this kind of thing, especially when you have multiple coaches in a boat mm-hmm. <laughs> and the different verbiage that comes out for some most of a lot of us, especially those that sit in the middle of the boat um, and are often the coaches in the boat as well. It's like I say something and I know all my folks back home would know what that is, but do you right. kind of thing. And so it's being aware of that in a boat yourself. Like, are you with people that 
you know, you've described all these different things too, and they know in that instant, like you said, Ron, what you mean, what the response should be, or is it something that you have to explain? Because if I'm jumping a crew with these guys and it's Paul, I have to explain, it's better to keep my mouth shut. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. hard. I did a, I did the gorge race a few years ago and I wasn't supposed to do it. I just got a call the night before the race and they're like, Hey, you're in town, jump in the boat. Oh, by the way, you're seat three. And I was like, I almost did another dirty word. <laughs> and, um, you know, so like, so what I did is I took all the calls that I use on my home crew and just eliminated half of them and just said, Hey, all I'm going to do is these three things, you yeah. know? And so mm -hmm. I told them what I, I would say, you know, I'll say, give me a push, go, you know, to get on a bump. And they're like, okay, got it. And then <laughs> I had a guy sitting behind me. He was really, really excited. And the first time I called hut, he said, ho, so loud. He was like, oh, I was like, oh, oh no. Okay. One more thing. I don't want to hear the ho, you know? <laughs> and then it worked and we did good. I mean, we ended up, I think we ended up, third in the over 40 so it was like it ended up working but keep like if you're if you're putting together a crew of people from all over then like dumb it down make it really simple make the calls really simple you know a few Answer. years ago i actually ended up doing i was doing gorgeous i knew i was going to be racing with a crew that i was new to and i thought i was just going to sit in four and just paddle and we got out to the start line they're like no you call the bumps and I was like, oh, okay. And uh, like, no, no offense, but we're Canadians, right? So we don't really, a lot of people don't really get <laughs> surfing, you know? And so I was having to call these bumps and we were having a lot of success. And then people would just be, you know, we'd be having a wave and they just keep hammering down the wave. And I was like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. <laughs> right. And so I ended up, yeah. I ended up having to narrate basically the whole 20K and it just was so exhausting. It was really satisfying because we had we had a great race, but it was just like I just nonstop, like no, 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 stop, no, 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 go this, that, that. It, it was, it was so hard. But yeah, like I just couldn't, I could, I needed to be descriptive and not just have quick calls just to get my point across a lot, just to yeah. get people to stop hammering all the time. It was a really interesting experience. That's cool. I think that just yeah. comes with experience. Yeah. And often we talk about you know what are the calls to, to go up, but not really describing what's what's the call to come down what's the feeling mm -hmm. to come down and so that needs to be described just as much as the, the going up even in flat water mm -hmm. yeah and don't forget you guys we're supposed to be a crew that you've never met before so that's pretty mm -hmm. complex if you're talking about what to do on a bump and stuff i think if you've never especially if you have varying degrees of experience on the boat but while we're still on palo there is a question because I think this is legit is how do you judge exactly the number of strokes? Because when I know when I started in this sport, I would ask people, well, how many are you supposed to do? Like I thought there was one legit number that, well, Johnny Puake said eight, but this person said 12. And so I know like I, our crew worked on what our sort of ultimate number is in certain water conditions with Paolo down in Miami. So I'm just curious, like, how would you guys work out what that number is, um, either with a new crew or not with a new crew? And Chelsea alluded well, to this earlier in terms yeah, of like, That's depends on the experience as well. Um, but what's yeah. the difference between 10 and 12, for example? When's your well, steer steering is my answer yeah. to that one. Let's say that again. When is your steer steering? Or when do you anticipate them steering? Mm. So from my point of view, if I'm in three or four or wherever I am and I have to call, I'm feeling or anticipating what the steer is going to have to do because I don't want to call a change when they're in the water poking because then nobody's mm. paddling the boat, but you got one person pulling it back kind of thing. And so I try to time when I'm the one calling and when I teach people about calling, I try to teach them to feel the boat, anticipate what the steer is going to do because I don't care if it's between eight and 16, as long as you're calling when it's not steer or steering. That, that's actually a good point. I, mean, I, don't know how you guys feel about, I don't know how you feel about them speaking too. Like I know there's been times where I think you guys have, have not done the call because Cheryl's, sorry, our steers is in the middle of saying, okay, we're, no, 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 we're doing this and that. So then you're like, wait, 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 and hut ho. And so it's yeah. about adaptability, right? Like being able to. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think what water conditions that. are around you, kind of I thing. Is there? Yeah, I think what Chelsea said, you know, earlier, like if you're dealing with a novice crew or if you're dealing with, you know, uh, it, it a lot of it'll determine uh, your skill level, right? So the more novice the crew, usually the longer the strokes will go. Now, let's say I got a strong crew and they're well drilled, eight to 10. And if I'm trying to chase somebody down and we're working hard, we're probably changing on six. Now, that being said, it's not set in stone for me. It's set by effort. Your body should be screaming, I need to change. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting to stroke number 12 and you're like, man, I could take like four more, maybe you're not working that hard, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, so again, like in this scenario, we're kind of like a brought together crew. I'd probably say we'd be changing at like 10 or 12, just cause we're all kind of, mm -hmm. we're all going to have slightly different um, like stroke mechanics and things like that. If it's a crew that I've trained a long time, 10 is probably the longest it'll go, you know, but there you really should be like, your body should be screaming. I got to change sides. Like sometimes when I get in a, in a boat and it's like, you know, they're changing at like 16, 18, I'm like, oh man, my eyes are rolling backwards in my head. I, you know, so, but, and then I have to adjust. I have to, like, I have to adjust because they want to run a longer stroke rate. That's fine. So then I got to adjust how I am applying power to the paddle. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I, it, when you change is kind of like the stroke rate, it's kind of like that question with the stroke rate, mm -hmm. you know, what stroke rate should we run at? Well, how fast are you going? Well, how often should we change? Well, how hard are you paddling? I, I so, also like a little bit more kind of malleability to my sides. Uh, I might drive my crew crazy a couple of times, but if a side's feeling really, really good, I might try to extend it to another stroke or two just to kind of utilize the most out of it. Uh, and then yeah. if, we're, if we're on a side and it's just not gelling, we're not, we don't have any flow, uh, maybe cut it a bit early and get over to the new side again. Yeah, that's a good point too. You know, you're looking at how the boat's running. Um, again, if you're the caller, right? And you're saying, hey, this is, this is kind of flowing really good. And you might call for a little extra pressure and you see that the, that the boat just gave you a half mile an hour. You'll, you'll, you'll get a couple more strokes out of it and then call the change, you know, but, mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe you're about to get on a bump. Maybe there's a boat wake, maybe there's, you know, all sorts of other reasons. And sometimes I'll even call out, Hey, quick changes are coming. Like I'll say it like, Hey, next mm -hmm. couple changes, they're going to be quick. And everybody knows, okay, we're, we're you know, we're going to have to be paying attention and, and listening really loud. So I hope that helps. I hope that answers the question. Actually, in that respect, um, you know, do you get, you also give warning, warning calls uh, when, you know, when you're calling pushes, when you're calling, you know, various things like I like, I, I personally like it when whoever's calling a push gives a little, some kind of an indication that that's usually pretty unique to the person. But uh, it's like you said, like you, you know, they might say little one or some people say now, but, you know, and just, just a little sort of a lead in so that you know something's coming up because a lot of times, you know, in windy wavy conditions or whatnot, you will, the people up front won't hear um, a, a one word call or, or, they, or they'll, you know, or there some doubts will come into their minds. Like, was, was that a push? You know, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. So I, I, I like to, um, yeah, I'll like, again, with, I'll, I'll throw out a little bit, go, you yeah. know, so okay. yeah. you hear the little bit and then the goes coming after it and they know I'm going to ask for three hard strokes when I say the right. go. Um, yeah. It's coming. Like, yeah. Charles our steers yeah. used to say lifting yeah. or build yeah. it or yeah. something. Or, or I'll tell them, or, or the other one that I do that the strokers usually like is I'll be like right there. I'll just call out like, like the boat's running good. I'll just be like right there, right there, you know, and they know, okay, this, like, it's, it's good right now. Like, just, and it lets everybody know. So sometimes mid, you know, not even on a chain, just midway, I'll be like right there, right there. And, you know, again, that's the whole psychologist cheerleader, you know, thing. Yeah, I always say but, like, you're talking about stroke rate, you're talking about, uh, you know, all these different things. And I always kind of, it's kind of kind of zen, I guess, or whatever. But I always think like, look, our medium that we're doing, it's fluid. 
it's it's fluid. So everything that we do in the boat has to also be fluid to reflect that. Anything that has like too rigid a structure is going to impact your overall efficiency and effectiveness. So you have to be able to to change up, down, sideways, whatever, with your calls, with your stroke rate, with your you know the, the number of strokes per side. All that stuff has to be malleable, and you have to build that into your experience as you go. As, and as you get more experience with bigger, more crews and things like that, you'll you'll see that I think the top crews are all flexible in that in those ways. So anyway, Paul, I think you've done a really good uh, really good points i just wanted to say one of the things i like the most of what you said was the quiet crew i think um you know if you have a, if you have a, a a crew that is confident you have a crew that is quiet and lets everyone kind of do their job and mm -hmm. so uh if you can have that where you have the space for, for someone in three who's really good at what they do to just sort of to operate the boat and change the gears and things like that it's it's uh yeah, it brings my confidence up from wherever seat I'm sitting in. I just really, really like that. So I thought that was an awesome point. I'm also really glad that all of you came up with reasons to not stay with the 10 on this side, 10 on that side, or 12 on this side. No, but really because like when you first start in this sport, you think that's what it is. And every single one of you had a reason, a different reason for why it might not be. It might, it might change over when you have to do this and it might change. Sure. So I, like, I, I think that's one thing, especially people that are coming from dragon boating have to understand is you're going with the flow and you're going with mother nature. You're not, it, it, it's not, you know like this exact pattern on either side so I'm glad every single one of you said something about that so I'm really glad you guys clarified all one of that one, one other thing I'll say about three uh, and is <clears throat> unlimited canoe versus spec canoe so in the spec canoe three and four are kind of like the ones that are especially four is like guarding the ama for the huli right because I know you guys just had the the race that was like utter chaos and everybody was like the canoes got smashed up so four is like <laughs> reaching back but in the in the unlimited it's actually three and five that are guarding the huli because the unlimited is so light that when that ama pops up you're just you're just kind of hanging yourself you're going for the for the aku and mm -hmm. you're leaning forward as mm -hmm. you take the stroke and and kind of trying to bring it down right so you know, as far as like safety goes, that's the kind of the other thing that three does. It's like, hey, watch the ama. You know, you'll call that out. Like, you know, watch the ama. You know, and, and that's the, the the other the other thing. And that's again why I think your three and your six should spend time in the two man because they start to get they start to click. You know, it makes a it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, something Paulo mentioned a second ago, I think um, that we didn't. I don't think we directly touched on was that um, if you've got seat three calling pushes and uh, huts, they can co that person can coordinate so that you can have you know go to uh, fresh sides all the time, right? Whereas uh, if somebody uh, if steer is calling the pushes, there's there's eventually going to be some kind of conflict or, or miscommunication. Um, you know, someone's on on a side too long. And you, you miss an opportunity for a push, that sort of thing, right? So, um, are we ready to move on to seat four? Leanne? Sure. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Leanne. I'm in Kelowna now. I um, used to be back in Toronto. Um, I've been paddling for ooh, since 98, kind of thing. Um, somebody else can do the math for me. And yeah, I've raced everything from world sprints to Tiaito to Pailolo to Nawahini to Queen Lily to all that kind of fun stuff. So Catalina, I've been around a few times um, and paddled with, I'm one of those people that because I come from a, a smaller club that doesn't tend to, you know, sometimes we don't travel a lot together. We tend to do our local stuff. I'm often that person that's dumped in or asked to jump into other people's crews. Um, so I go <laughs> through this experience quite frequently in terms of trying to figure out, okay, what are people's calls and having to adapt to other crews, um, whether they're all from the same club or whether it's our national team coming together um, and having to find a system that works for us. So I'm usually seat three, four. I've done in change races. Sometimes I get thrown five, two. Sometimes in men's crews, I get thrown five or two. Um, it all depends on what, uh, 
what the, <laughs> what the crew makeup is. Um, often in my boat, doesn't matter if I'm three or four, I'm often the caller just because people are afraid of me apparently now. Um, so, <laughs> or they get nervous <laughs> kind of when I'm in the boat, but I'm encouraging other people to take on the calls and just let me sit back and let other people take the reins um, so that they can learn. Um, and because I'm not always going to be in the boat with them. So um, seat four, from my perspective, is my job is to provide that stabilizing feature in terms of keeping things kosher in the boat. Um, if there's relays that need to come up from seat six, communicating those kind of things up to one, especially in windy conditions. If there's things that need to be communicated up, um, talking about that kind of thing, Paulo mentioned already with the spec boats, um, seat four, I'm looking, I'm keeping an eye on the AMA. Um, and then if I'm, if I'm calling bump in any boat, I'm watching the AMA to help with the bump as well, um, to help us ride it. And Paulo, I totally agree spending time, if you're in seat three or, or four and you're the caller or calling the pushers in, your in the boat, spending time with the seat six is hugely beneficial because they all have their little their way of approaching um, different things, whether it be out in waves or whether it be just a boat wake of how they tend to angle towards a boat wake or away from it. Um, if you're spending time in a two van or two person boat, you really get to know what they want to do. So you can anticipate that in the six person um, as you get going. Um, often, because I'm also a coach at our club, I'm often the one calling the cues. Um, so like you said, the Communication is key in terms of what things mean and making sure that everybody in the crew knows that it's okay to ask. If you heard something that you're like, what the, what does that mean? And you have no idea, say something. Instead of waiting till the end of the race and you're debriefing, you're like, yeah, every time you called that, I had no idea what you meant. And it was like, well, okay, well, no, but say something. Um, ideally getting that stuff out before a race, <laughs> hopefully in practices it comes to be, um, knowing what those are, but also being that cheerleader. Like I'm often, because I like a longer stroke than most people, I like that time in the water. I like to put a lot of weight on that blade. Um, I like, <laughs> thanks to the person that sent this into the chat, I like to be in charge. Yep, <laughs> that's not a, a surprise to anybody. Um, thanks for getting me off my game there. Who said that? Um, what was I saying? Oh, I'm, I'm often going to talk to one too about what I want in terms of the stroke. Um, like if I'm in a men's boat or super strong women's boat, then what I want isn't as necessary. Um, often in a women's boat, because I am a fairly strong paddler, according to some people, um, I like I like that length. So like jumping in for bridges with a crew from another club, it's like, or what I'm going to do in a couple of weeks and jumping in a race is just, I'm going to give them feedback. We're like, Hey, this is great. This is awesome. If you can give me this, that'd be, that'd be lovely. If not, we're good. Like giving them feedback um, instead of them wondering. And I've had seat ones come to me. It's like, I never know. I never know what you want. And it's like, okay, well, I'm going to tell you. Um, and like Paulo mentioned earlier, he's like, he often tells the seat ones to overreach a little bit, especially when the three fours really like those long strokes, just to give them that chance to get that power. Because ultimately, I'm a 220 pound ass that you don't want to haul. I can't carry my own weight, some kind of thing. Like, I, I'm a big dead weight, which is why they don't often put me in seat six, <laughs> even though I ask to steer sometimes, but they never let me, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but yeah, follow and everybody has already covered a lot of things in seat four in terms of calling, in terms of encouraging, in terms of calling bump. Here in Kelowna, it all depends on kind of who's most comfortable or who's most experienced. And basically, what we need to do to balance the boat side to side, front to back, three, four for us are often interchangeable um, kind of thing. It just depends on the makeup of the crew for us. But responsibility wise, um, three, four are, are interchangeable in terms of the bumps and the calls and the calling for us kind of thing. So, yeah. And then I often like to talk, like we talked about seat two, whispering sweet nothings um, to seat one. I love it when seat five talks to us in the middle of the boat. I really do. 
um, just because there's times where you just get so in your zone of you're focusing so much on what you're feeling through your bum and through your paddle. And for me, focusing on what the steer is going to call so I know when to call things or right and left out a little bit is one a little off of three, like watching all these little things. But sometimes it's just nice to hear that way to go. I can feel you like those kind of things coming from behind me or like I'm pushing you. Or I'm right here with you. Like it's lovely. And I've had Chelsea do that for me in races before. I never had somebody do that until she did it. And I was like, oh, I really like this. I like it. Anyway, thought I'd mention that. That's all for me. It's funny because I made a list. I made a list today and I put that on my, I was like, oh, you know, um, because I know a lot of people are saying quiet boat, but it's not done in a loud way when I'm behind these girls. So these girls in three, four, I find it's um, because, you know, typically in my club, I would be a three, four because I'm five, 10, 175. But then I get in with these girls and it's like, oh, you're a two or a five now, right? So you feel a bit kicked out of those meat seats, right? But when these girls start to, to take on that role, I want them to know that I'm like, I'm there, I'm there too. So I just say behind it would be her and Helen or whoever in the middle, I'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like the whole Queen Lily for two hours and 10 minutes, right? And um, because that race, I mean, we had to, to determine what our goal was for that day and it was to win. So it was going to be, we were going to die on that line. Like it was, everything had to be a hundred percent the whole race. And it was Waikiki beach girls were right up our ass the whole time. So it, yeah, it was awful. Um, probably the hardest race of my life, but yeah, so we have, but we already had a bit of that connection before. Cause we'd just come off of racing in new Caledonia for worlds, but, um, and, and further to that. So six behind me is always talking to me and I like that and she's even going after like she's telling me where she's going okay I'm gonna go left okay okay that's my mark but it was it's nice for me because it keeps me busy I'm going okay 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 like I'm I'm kind of on it then I'm saying something quietly to her in front of me and and it worked for us but that was determined before we raced right so you don't want to jump into a crew and just boom I'm whispering to all these people and she's whispering and whatnot without us having the same goal right so I I landed once in um I went to Victoria and there was a, a race and I just last minute sent out an email. Hey, anybody need somebody? Um, and it was Powell River. So they, whoever it was, scooped me up and I had no clue who anybody was. Um, I was pretty, pretty green, actually an outrigger. I'm actually an original rower. Yes. <laughs> rower, um, like in my teen years, then after I pretty much killed myself playing rugby, went back to the canoe club, started in, um, Sprint canoe, high yield canoe, war canoe, um, kayak, like sprint kayak, then to outrigger and did almost all those races that Leanne said with her and then uh, left for the dragon boat scene for the last maybe like eight world champs, world cups. And now I'm back to some more open water stuff. So I'm kind of, <laughs> kind of wherever, wherever, whatever happens, wherever the race is, let's go. So uh, anyway, I arrived at this race and so um, had no idea what the crew was going to be like. And I had to sit and figure out what their end goal was. Well, their end goal was to make it to the finish line. Very different than mine, right? So I have to go with the majority. The majority is saying, we just want to make it to the finish line. So we did have some stops during the race. And that had to be okay with me because that was their goal. I'm coming into a crew. You guys need me. Fine. That wasn't the end goal. Queen Lily, uh-uh. That was, the, we established it before we raced. And so we had, we had to do that, right? Um, in that actual, in the Queen Lily race from seat five, uh, we had some trouble between seat three and four. And because I work with, I work with a lot of breast cancer survivors as well. I coach a lot of them. I've started to be a little more heightened with health as well. So I'm kind of watching for if somebody's behaving in a different way, um, somebody maybe needs something, maybe they're dehydrated. That day was crazy hot. That wasn't our issue, but it could be something like that. So I'm kind of the eyes um, watching for if somebody's not right and somebody was not right and we had to help her and we got to, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was Leanne. Um, so it, it was, you know, this whatever, diabetic low, high, whatever you call it, but she wasn't behaving herself and something was, she was looking around and we have these beach girls right up and I'm, I was like, oh, I said, Cheryl, I don't think something's not right. Something's not right. And then I said, Helen, check, like, does she need her water? What's going on? So we're, we're having this conversation, but we can't put our paddles down because our end goal is to, is to win. Anyway, she got what she needed. We got to the finish line and then she got some help. So that's a side note of what I watch for from 
from seat five. Um, I'm also always prepared in seat five to be on the left for an extra amount of time. So I've been asked when I'm in bigger stuff, uh, again, whispered in my ear, like stay left, stay left. So if, if the steers is seeing that they're almost kind of coming, there's a wave coming this way, she'll just say stay left. So I just put my weight there a bit and I just, fine. I have to be prepared to stay there for, for however many changes she wants me to be, right? So I never ever question. It's not up for discussion when you're racing. It's yep, yep. Got it, got it. I don't need to know why, because that takes energy out of somebody's breath. It's just got it, got it. You can talk about it at the end, right? So um, uh, just a technical thing. When I sit in seat five, I um, I know we're not talking open ocean, but my brain is excited about, about big waves. Um, I would choose a slightly shorter paddle because I have a few different, I have everything from a 49 to a 52, right? And I know in Pilolo in five, I was often stuck stuck up to here, right? With like the wave was here and I couldn't get, I was trying to get get it up to get to the next one, right? So I would have maybe chose a one inch, uh, one inch difference, one inch shorter. So that's just a little technical part. Um, as far as racing, I am like, Leanne knows I'm really about chemistry. It doesn't matter if you're new, if you're old, I try to figure out right from the get go what everybody needs. And, um, you know, what, if so-and-so races this way and, and they need me to say something in their ear the whole race, good, cool, I'll do that. Even if I don't like it, doesn't matter. I'm going to go faster if you can go faster, right? So I'm, I'm always kind of aware of what kind of energy everybody needs and uh, try to have everybody bring, um, I call it rock what you got, right? So when I went from being the big girl to, into that crew, um, I struggled a bit, like for that Molokai year, I was like, I don't know what my role is. I'm not the big, I'm not, up to three four anymore like what do I do right and then all of a sudden I was two five and um so I had to kind of go within and go what am I going to bring to this race I'm going to bring my fitness is going to be the thing that that'll be it I'll try to be the fittest one out there um you know if you can't be the strongest if you're a lady in a mixed crew let's say and you go oh gee I got these big boys in the middle right that means I don't sit back that means I could try to match those big boys right and we we all go faster that way so I have a slight obsession with racing. So even if it's an easy race, I just want to do our best. I don't, I don't really care, right? Um, and oh, and seat five too. I also find I have to push off the back a lot more, right? Like stroke wise. So when I see, sit in seat two, I feel so much of my lats, right? From planting. And once I go back into five, uh, my steers is always like, push, off, push, push, push. And it's true because it's, it's moving so fast on that wave that I have to kind of whoo, like put, add in some power there. And I always think if I can do that better than that seat five over there, then we're going faster, whether we're in 50th place or second place, right? Or first. So that's kind of where I think, um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about seat five, but yeah. yeah. Like Charles, you're, you're bang on the mark in terms of the water feels different mm -hmm. back in five versus the front Absolutely. of the boat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Water is yeah. moving differently. One, it's disrupted because you've got paddles going in and out ahead of you. So you've got their mm -hmm. swirls. Yeah. Plus, it's just, it's moving water. It's like sitting in the back seat, nine, 10 in a dragon boat. Those seats are so important. Uh -huh. um, and it's, you have to have someone super skilled back there to feel water because trying to get that pressure on the blade is so mm -hmm. difficult back there. Yeah. Because the water is- And it feels, so like a, it feels like a demotion. Same thing in a dragon boat. It all mm -hmm. feels, everybody thinks I'm demoting them when I put them farther back. And you, you can't look at it that way. If you're sitting in a seat five, it's not because you can't keep time or whatever. Sometimes it's a size thing, a, a you know, arm mm -hmm. length thing, whatever. But you want somebody back there who can find the work, find the work, find yep. the water, push off it and contribute, right? So you have to be putting it in pretty quickly. If we come in soft, you can easily stay in time, but your paddle's just going with the water. Well, that looks lovely, mm -hmm. but are you, are you contributing, right? Right. That's right. Yeah. You got to be, yeah. you got to be aggressive going to that catch in five. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, really I, love, I yeah, I love being in five just because yeah. the other thing the other thing that's cool about five is you can just hammer. You ain't mm -hmm. you know, like you can just go. And so when and like like I I, I love your energy. Like I, I just want to jump in a boat listening to her talk. She's like, ah I'm like, yes, let's go it's fucking race. Much, I know. Right? No, it's awesome. You know, but it's been like, a while. When I get when I get put in five, I'm just like, this is cool. Like, all right, let's yeah. go. And and I think you made a really good point in that people sometimes think, and in dragon boating the same thing. If they're from seven back, they're like, oh man, I must suck. And now, man, five. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Leanne, you've probably heard it. I mean, 
Johnny used to put Lauren Spalding in five and she's like top water woman forever. Yeah. Right. And just because she could steer, she could like push yeah. the boat it, and she, she could, and, and you can just hammer, you can just go. Well, she's right? probably from rotational from surf ski and kayak. Right. So she's mm -hmm. used to that far back stroke. So it probably works. Right. Yeah. yeah. And one thing that I tell people sometimes is that you are talking about the swirls. I, 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 I use stupid analogies. I call them jellyfish, you know, okay. the swirls coming off the paddle. Yeah, so yeah. in five, in five, sometimes you're looking for, you're, you're looking to avoid that jellyfish, right? So you, you're, mm -hmm. you're coming mm -hmm. up, you're going to set your blade and you're trying to find that heavy water. You just, you just reach over that little jellyfish and plant it, you know, and then yeah. you get, then you're able to get a little bit of more bite and that takes skill. That takes someone that's like focused and you don't put, you know, you, you you're better off putting somebody novice in four and putting someone experienced in five you know to, yeah. to get your to get your contribution out of your crew with, with my novice crews i tend to uh, rotate people through one two and five uh just because you know the the width of the boat you know seat placement you know is a large a lot of times is dictated by width of the boat type, type of thing um because the people that are in three four cannot sit in, in two five but I try to rotate them through so that I've got flexibility in setting crews as well, right? Because, you know, you don't want to come to race day and it's like, you know, you don't have somebody to sit in seat two or you don't have someone to sit in seat five, right? Because they're not experienced in those seats. So uh, another comment so, on... So, oh, go ahead. Sorry, another comment on Chelsea's comment on Pilolo. Um, when, when we do Pilolo, we have seat five paddle with a steer slate. What? Uh, <laughs> we have seat five paddle with a steer slate. Because wow. so, so Actually, they can they they can so they can, they're, they're assistant steer right so they can right. they can help out yeah yeah and, and the other thing too get is that the water <laughs> well well it'll be a short well you know it'd be appropriately sized Shorter. Shorter. <laughs> but um but um you know we we choose the seat fives rotate seat fives through at a race like that because uh, that seat has to be a, a, someone who can steer. Right, so a steers yeah, person yeah. sitting in seat five will be used to paddling <laughs> with the steers blade, so it's not as if it's all of a sudden this massive blade they're not used to, right? So, yeah, yeah. And then if they need to do a poke or something or a static draw, that you know they got the right blade to do it. So, yeah. Ron, I think yeah. we're finally down to seat six. Oh well, okay. Just a note to the uh, just a note to the audience that the person who was supposed to speak to seat six isn't here, wasn't able to make it. So, so I am a steer, and I have steered like lots and lots of races, but I have not steered Pilolo. Uh, I haven't. I steered the Gorge a number of times, uh, lots of times. I've steered uh, Catalina and and uh, Queen Lily, and I absolutely hated Queen Lily actually because the homicide waves drove me nuts, um, and, and lots of other races. So. I think everybody knows that, you know, seat six is um, uh, the, the captain of the boat, basically. They're responsible for the safety and well-being of the crew. Um, uh, you know, they're one, one thing that seat six, I think, needs to do is, you know, before each race, give the crew a rundown of what the strategy is for the race, like what the race course is. Uh, you know, what the water conditions are, what the tide's doing, all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, we've, we've done crazy, we, we did crazy eights in Nanaimo one time. And, and uh, one of our paddlers thought that there was still another loop around another island. <laughs> you know? And she was pacing herself for an extra 5k or something that, did, that didn't exist, right? Um, so, you know, you know, have to know what, where the turns are and what people, you know, what, people are going to do on the turns, whether they're going to be sprint turns or whether you're going to take them wide. And, you know, you call it out ahead of time, depending on whether there are boats around you, that sort of stuff. Right. So that's one thing so that everybody knows, um, you know, what the legs are in the race. If it's a, if it's an out and back, or if, if it's a finger race, you're going out and back. If there's a, do uh, a dog leg at the end, you know, coming back in towards the beach, isn't the end. There's another leg along shore right so that everybody knows exactly you know how they have to um sort of pace themselves for the effort and where that final push is going to be for the end of the race that sort of thing um 
in terms of steering, um, I don't necessarily want to really want to get into steering because that'll be a subject, uh, the subject of another uh, town hall with people a lot more qualified than me. <laughs> um, but um, go, going into um, going into the uh, crew dynamics and stuff like that, you know, um, like like Paulo was saying, um, when you're steer, you've got lots of things to think about, right? So from my perspective, to the extent that the crew can run themselves, that that's fantastic, right? Because I, I from from being in seat six, I cannot see seats one and two. Uh, I can't actually see what they're doing. I can see top hands that if if the, if the top hands are too high, I can see that and I can relay that up, you know. Um, but and I'm talking about my novice crews because I coach novices, right? Um, but to the extent that you know, I don't really know um, whether the rate that one, two, and three are setting um, is working for the crew or not, because I'm paddling, poking, switching sides, and I'm not on I'm not on the same side as seat four all the time, right? I'm doing my own thing, right? Uh, to get the boat, to keep the boat in line, on track, whatnot. Um, so, I'm not, I find that, and, and someone can correct me, you know, say you're totally, you know, left field here or something, but I tend to feel that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sort of um, in tune with the exact timing uh, or whatnot of the crew and the feel of the boat as much as the people that are in the middle of the boat. Is that, now, Leanne, would you... Are you, I, actually, I don't even know if you're a steer. You're not a steer, are you? I, I can steer. I think James <laughs> would probably be a better person to talk about than this. He spends way more time back there than I do. Yeah, this is actually, I'm actually interested to get uh, some input from the from the, the panel here on this too. But um, I actually do feel very much in rhythm. I even think when I'm at the back, if I'm not paddling, I'm definitely like, you know, yeah. moving with the, in the rhythm of the crew all the time, trying to contribute any way I can. Um, I think one thing that's important, and this is what I want to kind of, kind of get some feedback on, is when you have, you know, as someone who's going from one to six or whatever, like I always have that like, oh my God, I have to contribute. I have to be always positively contributing. And so if you're steering and you're like, okay, well, I got to make it up. I got this big ass blade. What am I going to do here? And as soon as you have a chance to pally, you just go, Ooh, and you just like absolutely hammer it. Um, and I think as a steerer, you actually want to be less obvious than that. You need to rein yeah. yourself in, understand you have mm -hmm. a bigger blade and actually contribute without letting the boat know that you're doing anything. I think it's mm -hmm. kind of, uh, uh, um, as a steerer, I think you want to be, nobody, you, you don't want anyone to know you're there. So when you're helping, right, maybe they feel like, oh, this is a really, the rhythm is really happening right now, but they don't yeah. want to feel that big, oof, oof, because you can actually, you know, send the boat off kilter and things like that too. Um, you know, I think you just need to be very much contributing without interrupting the boat, without letting them know whether you're in or out positively or negatively, what you're doing back there, always contributing to the run of the boat. Um, so I actually think that it, you need to stay, especially in like, if you get into bigger bumps and things like that as a steerer, you need to be really in tune with what's happening mm -hmm. in front of you. Uh, like Paulo said, you're, your head is on a swivel. You're always looking for, where's an opportunity to maximize my speed? Where can I go to this place to get a better run, better line? better speed into the, the back current, a little bit of wave, everything like that. And you have to always be paying attention and always be moving in rhythm with what else is happening. You really can't be out of, out of what's happening in front of you. Well, I think uh, in my, uh, what, I, what I actually meant was that I tend to paddle with their rhythm, right? But I don't know whether the stroke, the, the, the rate that's being set is, uh, is working for three and four right? That, that, that's what I meant. Um, so like, right, I right. just, I just paddle with whatever's going on in front of me. Right. But, I guess I would say that, that it's not your job to, to, it's up to three and four to tell the stroke seat if that's working for them or not. You know, right. like I was saying before, like the stroke seat is working in service of the rest of the crew. Like everyone's working towards a common goal, but the stroke for mm -hmm. sure is in service of the people who are delivering the power, right? Yeah. Not that the stroke seat's not contributing. So in this case, Leanne and, and Paolo, that's their job to tell me whether what I'm doing is 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 working or not. 
uh, like as a steerer, you've got enough to worry about without worrying if Leanne and Paolo are getting what they need from the stroke seat. That's where you get that little bit of communication happening. And that's where the dynamic with two comes in. And, you know, five comes into that too, because yeah. I mean, even think like pacing a little bit stroke rate can actually impact whether Chelsea hits the jellyfish or not too, right? So I don't know. What do you all think about that? I think you're bang on that it's it's not your yeah. job like when i'm back there steering it's like mm -hmm. i don't know what the stroke if the stroke rate's great or not because i'm getting strokes in when i can but i'm not i'm not going oh, i gotta change like i need to change because i'm changing whenever i need to because i'm controlling the boat by changing kind of thing i'm trying to do it all by steer stroke like draw strokes instead of poking so i don't notice much about the stroke rate and that kind of stuff i can tell when the run of the boat isn't quite on um but other than that like i can feel a lot of it there's twisting going on like if people are coming in and out of the boat with their body mm -hmm. weight i can tell if people oh, are yeah. coming down with their body weight those kind of things but as far as the stroke rate side of things i just leave that to the middle of the boat that's not my job yeah i think what you said about you know uh you don't want to be felt <clears throat> like when i steer that's usually what I try to avoid. And that's usually what I like. I, I, I shouldn't steer, you know, I'm, I'm, unless it's really big water, I shouldn't steer, you know, yeah. and the, but that's the thing, right? Like I used to have this guy here who he, he thought that as the steers person, he could affect the stroke rate. And what he would do is jerk the boat really hard to try to get them to adjust the stroke rate. And finally mm -hmm. I just showed him the GPS and I said, look what happens every time you jerk the boat. You know, and so we have a girl down here who's really, really, a, she's an awesome steers person. And we paid her a compliment after a race. We said, we didn't feel you back there at all. And she kind of looked at us like, like and I said, no, no, that's a really good thing. Like, you know, <laughs> like, because the boat was just moving, right? So, yeah, I agree with what James said. It's like the, yeah. the yeah, and, and poking's not always a bad word, you know? That's the other thing. Like a lot of steers people, they start doing them. They start posting and doing all this crazy shit. Sometimes just poke, poke soft, really? poke often, and yeah, take a really short yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, better than yeah. hanging out there. Or like I've had steers people, especially some of the newer men um, that were teaching the steers. Like they reach out there and they try and reef that boat over the paddle, and like you feel that, oh. that swing yep. again. We don't want to feel you back there. I don't want to feel mm -hmm. what kind yeah. of steer stroke you're doing. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you get that canoe on a bump and just poke it and hold it there and just enjoy the ride. Like throw a shock into the camera. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. Because like you know, I, I guess, and it comes with steers' experience as well. That you know, you have to figure out um, what strokes work uh, with your crew as well. Because if you've got you know, a really light crew, you may be, it might be easier for you to work mostly with draw strokes, right? But if you've got like a heavier crew, you, you know, I, I know that I, I can't haul the, you know, you know, my draw strokes aren't as effective if I've got somebody heavier in seat, seat five, for example, that type of thing, right? Um, and you do have to adjust your stroke uh, or your stroke with the bigger blade. Um, I tend to be a little bit of a noisy paddler when I'm in, uh, when I'm paddling because I'm not going as deep because I know that if I go, I put my full blade, my full steers blade under the water, I'll be dragging when I exit, right? Because it's, it's like, you know, X number of inches longer than, than the, the blades that everyone else in the boat's used, right? Does that, does that, does that make sense to other people? That's my thinking anyways. I, I don't, that could be out of left field as well. <laughs> well, I was talking with uh, Jimmy Austin. Um, we were in Molokai and he, that guy can steer. I mean, like it's, it's insane. Um, and he can just read the water. But one, one point that he made to me about steering, he said, if you paddle with a 48 or a 50, right? your steering blade is going to be longer. And most, a lot of times people will set their steering blade at the same size as their paddling blade. But the other thing he said is the shaft is going to be the same length mm -hmm. as your paddling blade. Yeah. So if you, if you're using a 48, the length is in the, in the, 
in the paddle because a lot of times you're not going to stick the whole blade in the water, but you're still going to get enough bite to contribute to the crew. Yeah. So your changeovers are a little harder, but you get used to it, right? Because it's just practice. But and it's a heavier that's, paddle. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's a, that's something that a lot of steers people, you know, look at is they 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 is where the length of, in the paddle is. You want your shaft to be the same. You want the length yeah. to be in the blade. The extra length, yeah, the extra I, two inches or whatever. Yeah, my 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 steers blade's an extra inch. And I've, I've got a 50, I, I paddle with a 49, steer with a 50, and I actually have a 51 steers blade, but I think it hurts my shoulder when I use it too much because uh, that's two inches longer than my regular paddling blade. So, yeah. That might just be your big water blade. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, sort, it sort of is. Yeah. So. Yeah. I know we're, we're getting really short of time and I've got a couple of questions and we probably won't be able to cover both, but real quick, because I think you can cover this one quickly. Is there um, any comments or advice on weight distribution through the boat with the six paddlers and where you want the heavy paddlers and where you want the lighter paddlers, if you have the choice to do that? I, I would say it depends on the conditions. If you're surfing, you want weight in the front of the boat so you can go down waves on the flats. You probably want it more, more uh, uh, an even <laughs> trim. Is that right? I think you it always run on the boat design. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But but for the most part, you're always going to run front heavy. You know, you're going to run sixty forty most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I I can't think of a lot of I can't think of even I can't think of a, like a flat water condition where I would think that it was to my advantage to run tail heavy you know so you're either going to run dead balanced or you're going to run front heavy yeah yeah because if you're if you're tail heavy it's hard to steer like we, we've got an oc4 and if we have uh three people in it we we load up the front we have seats one two three is empty mm -hmm. and then four because uh otherwise you're you're like this and the nose you can't steer because the nose is, is up high right so um actually something that's related to distribution of weight is also distribution of power because I'm sure everyone's been in a boat where you didn't actually get the crew together before race day, <laughs> and then then you all of a sudden you're you're getting into the crew you're you're in the boat, and every single change the crew the boat's veering one way or the other because you've got a power imbalance left and right, right? Um, like there there's uh, so you know ideally you try and even that out ahead of time. That's why you have crew practices repeatedly. Well, I remember there's one time in, in uh, a couple a couple of times I think. Uh, uh, one time at Gibson's, we we jumped in the boat. We had never paddled together, uh, practiced together, and we did a race start and boat went all over to the side. So like you know, two or three minutes before the start of the race, I had a couple of guys switch seats, like jump in the water, switch seat now, you know, because that you know we were imbalanced. Um, we did that. We had some, we did something similar uh, in some, we had, I had a power imbalance in Vernon one time and Vernon has, has the beach start. So we didn't actually, uh, go out because we were practicing the beach start, but we had a power imbalance. So I had them paddle in pods, uh, throughout the race. I had, I think, I, I think it was seats one, one and one, two and five paddle on one side and three and four paddle on the other side for the entire race, because that's, that worked out to balance the boat better. Right. So, so, you know, sometimes you have to think of things on the fly um, uh, during a race as well, right? So, so we'll, just have, we'll just have Chelsea and Leanne like, just jump back and forth if we got a power imbalance. We'll just swap them. <laughs> that's all we'll do. Just... Oh, she's, she's strong. That's, that's what I'm saying. I can tell just by her energy. <laughs> like, just swap them quick. Come on. Come on, quick. Well, we got to run, gang. Okay. Were there any other questions that we didn't uh, address? There was just one. I, I mean, we don't really have time, but I just want to say this super quick. There was, it was sort of back to um, letting the boat know that you're changing a pacer, um, but uh, not a pacer, but the pace. And I, so I just want to put this comment out to you and see if anybody can elaborated on it really quickly. I was told recently, and I love this cue, that the pacers decide the pace in the air 
and seat three and four decide the pace in the water. Um, so I don't know if you all feel that way or not. We don't have a lot of time to respond to it, but if anybody wants to finish up with that. I think that can be a session all on oh, its own. Oh, God, yeah. That's yeah. a tough one. It was yeah. somebody who I was hoping. Okay. All right. So I, mean, yeah. I, I, the, I would say that the, 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 you change your rate in, for the air time, for sure. Your water time shouldn't be too different depending on you know, if you're going on a wave or getting in shallows, maybe there's some variation there, but I would think any adjustments you're making the time up or down to happen in the recovery. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's if, I'm, that's if I'm in the, if I'm in the middle and I want, and I want James to bring the rate up, I have to make him feel my catch. So the yeah. statement, I, I think the statement's actually accurate because if James wants, if James wants to slow me down, he's going to overreach mm -hmm. and take pressure off the blade. And I'm trying to stay in timing with him. So I got to, right. I got to work through the water. So, but if I, if I'm trying to get him to rate up, then I have to, he has to feel me. Like I have to load up the catch and, and kind of. Yeah. I think that's what really what was meant by that statement exactly yeah. is that it, yeah. the, the pacers are going to go with what they feel from behind them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And the, I, I think it's a variation on, you know, sometimes uh, the stroke needs to be told to, um, give give three and four time to catch like if the rate's too high right so like for for my not for not my novice crews you know sometimes we'd yell up to the front give them time to catch because they they're the ones that are hauling and, and need to have a very a really effective stroke all the way through right and that's the water time thing i guess i think we can have a whole talk on rate and water time and stroke yeah. i know six but like, we gotta like, say like, goodbye. That's like yeah. five sessions. Yeah. Oh, one other thing I thought of as well, um, in respect to the uh, communication back and forth in that, um, and, and, and I'm speaking to my novices that are on the call, is um, when you're communicating, you have to be able to say it within one breath. It's only a few very concise words. You should not be able to form full sentences. Okay. So that you 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 know which words to use, their particular words that you've agreed on or you know from practice or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you, if you can form a full sentence, you're not paddling hard enough. Okay. Those so words need to be positive and or encouraging. You're not telling yeah. something, somebody anything they're doing wrong. It's all yeah. a cue or something encouraging. Yeah. 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 And, and if it's an adjustment, you follow up with something positive as well so that they know that it's been fixed and they're doing good. Right. So, so the end, just before you say goodbye to everybody, as somebody who has a lot of questions, as opposed to a lot of answers, I want to thank the panel. You guys were so amazing. And I, um, and Chelsea, I want to paddle with you too. <laughs> um, but I do, but, I want to throw this crew together. This sound, it should be a lot of fun. But the come fact to Miami that, for a race. Let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. Like, Los Cabos, Los Cabos. <laughs> This is going to help us form other ideas for the future as well, right, guys, for these evenings, the fact that we couldn't quite get through everything. So anyway, but uh, Leanna and Ron, I'll turn it over to you to say goodbye to everybody. But I just wanted to say thank you to the panel because I really, I really appreciate all of your comments and wisdom. Yeah, welcome back to season two, everybody. We're looking at doing these. Uh, it's not going to be quite as frequent as we did last year um, because a lot of us are actually able to go out and train and be with other people now um, but we're going to keep them going at least once a month so stay tuned Ron? Okay. yeah thank thanks everybody for joining in on the call um just a couple of cora housekeeping items um we've got uh a lot of things coming up in the next month or so um we've got the cora agm which has been set for sunday november the 21st um, leading up to that, we've got a couple of other deadlines. Uh, we'll be sending out the notice of that sometime soon. Um, leading up to that, we've got a couple of other deadlines. Um, if you are a, uh, uh, a race coordinator or a race director at your club, the initial deadline for race submissions is October the 20th. That gives us enough time for, um, for the board to review them before the technical meeting, which will, will also be on November the 21st and resolve any conflicts. Um, if you're um, a club that uh, 
has uh, performed repairs and uh, may need to buy equipment, I'll be sending out the uh, open call for repair maintenance and equipment grants sometime soon. I'll probably establish a deadline um, sort of the first week or two of uh, November. Um, so um, we've only had, we've got uh, $15,000 in the budget, which is 15 grants of $1,000 each. We've only had three grants awarded. So we've got like 12,000 bucks up for grants. Um, but um, the eligible clubs, you're only allowed to have it every two years. So the eligible clubs will still get precedence, but still, um, you know, there's money up for grabs. So, uh, I'll, and I'll be sending that out. Uh, a notice will be posted. So watch the CORA website for details on that. And uh, we'll have a, another town hall in November sometime, I believe. We will need to avoid the AGM, but probably middle of November sometime, I think. Uh, the committee will be getting together to uh, set that up. And if you've got suggestions as to what the topics you want to hear, uh, what you want to see, uh, shoot us an email or shoot Leanne an email or me an email or Val an email or Eric uh, an email, whoever you know on the core board. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Have a great afternoon, all. all. See you. See you guys. Bye.